All right, good morning. Thank you guys that are joining us today. Thank you that are new. Welcome, right? Uh, online and in presence, right? Uh, I just pray that you are just refreshed today as you just wait in the river. Yeah, amen. Wow, what a morning already, okay? Wow, God's in the house. Holy Spirit is here, right? We've already had opposition, which is great because we know that something's going to happen, right? Amen. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, thank you, worship team, for just ushering in the Holy Spirit, right? It's nice and... and uh, yeah, absolutely. The words are bang on too, right? So, and uh, thanks, Don, for the announcements and, you know, maybe sticking your foot in your mouth a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes she does that in a way, but... <clears throat> okay, I'll, you're going to tell her that? Okay, all right. <laughs> it's online now, so we're good, right? So last week, we were in Scripture, right, uh, where four men brought a paralytic in over through the roof, right, Uh, that that they were bringing for healing, right? And they ripped off the roof of the house to get the paralytic into Jesus, right? We talked about how the enemy wants to put a lid on us, okay? And that's already, that that was already trying to happen this morning, Uh, in no way, right? Absolutely, right? In where we are, and who we are, and what we're called to do. Right? Uh, Trying to intimidate us. Try to stifle us. Try to detour us from who we are and what he's got for us. He wants to put a lid on our purpose, our calling, our authority that Jesus bestowed as we live out our walk, right? And unfortunately, he's good at that. And what he's good at is putting us in a place of paralysis, right? A place of stifling, a place of doubting, right? Reminding us sometimes of who we were before, before we came to Christ, Right? Sometimes he tries to throw that back at you. Right? <laughs> Putting guilt and shame back on us. Right? <laughs> and then sometimes he gets us to just question everything that we're doing. And it's good to question. It's good to know the truth. But he questions everything that we do. Right? He does. That we are called to do. But I want to tell you, this is the enemy, the devil, putting a lid on us. And we talked about last week that we're going to rip the lid off. And we did that. We did that in the spirit. And I really felt something shifted. Amen? Yeah, absolutely. But when he does that, he paralyzes us. He paralyzes us. Right? So when I was reading Mark 2, 2 through 12, right? This is where this whole message came from in this portion. Right? Yeah, I'll get you a change. Yeah. Right? So last week, Jesus tells a man his sins are forgiven, and then he says, take up your mat and go home. He says, walk and go home. Right? (laughs) And then he was fully healed. Right? He healed him. And his friends brought him there expecting the possibilities by removing the lid and ripping off the roof, literally, to get him in. This is just a a a recap, right? This part of the sermon, actually, this is God totally orchestrating all of this. Because as I was reading, it was like, this is going to be a two-part sermon, and really where I wanted to go. And then one of my brothers was... uh, you know, we, we had an opportunity to pray for him. And then there was a prof- prophetic word, pick up your mat. And then just a, a, an addition to that, it was a place where it's like, man, this just spoke into the sermon. It actually gave me the piece of, that I was looking for in the sermon. So God orchestrated all of this. He even orchestrated Joel coming here for this particular time, for this particular season, for everything that we're walking through right now as a church, as a body of believers. Right? 
So what I want to do is I want to talk to you today about the healing that happened where Jesus tells two different paralytics to pick up their mat. Two different paralytics who pick up their mat or their bed, sometimes they refer to it as a bed, and walk. Right? Three times in, in, in those places, right? There's repeated in some variation. It's obviously significant, right? Rise, take up your mat and walk. And it says, rise, take up your mat and go home. And then he rose immediately, took up his mat, and went out before them all. Those are the three instances there, those three words. Pick up your mat and walk. Yeah. So if you have your Bibles, I want you guys to go to John 5, 1 through 15. Okay? If not, you can use your app. Or if you didn't bring your phone, we can, it should be up there, okay? So I'm reading from NIV. So sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, okay? So there's pillars around it. Right? Here, a number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Right? So when Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that, what, that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked them, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid said, replied, I have no one to help me to get into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. And the day which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the, tap, uh, the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. You see, a paralytic at that time was an outcast, overlooked, unclean, probably living off the streets, and the handouts from others, right? And we would see them maybe as bums, right? They're unloved. They have no value in society. You see, the paralytic most likely only had on the clothes on his back and the mat that he lays on. <laughs> his existence was to be pitied. There was no cure for what ailed him. You remember, he's been there for a long time. Quite possibly, even if he could, he wouldn't be able to afford to go to the doctor at that time, Right? So, I think, church, we need to do this. I think we need to take a paralysis analysis. We do. I really think we need to take a paralysis analysis. What puts us in paralysis? What puts us in paralysis? You see, that man had been a paralytic for a long time. Right? Just as the other man was lowered into the roof that we talked about last week. We're not exactly sure, but it mentioned 38 years. So we don't know if that's from childbirth or something happened or whatever, right? But it is mentioned 38 years. So what puts us in paralysis? Lots of things, absolutely. Right? Two lies that we believe the enemy throws at us. There's two big lies. And I know he's good at doing this. 
His biggest lie is that we're disabled. You can't do anything. It's a lie and it's true, in a way. I'll tell you why. And the other lie is that we can do it all by ourselves. And we get stuck in paralysis. And you see, here's the, the paralytic. He says, Jesus, can't you see I'm paralyzed? I'm paralyzed. Uh, I have a more immediate problem here. Right? Jesus says, no, you don't. I don't see the problem. Here's what's interesting to take note of. The Lord didn't pick up the guy's mat for him. But rather, he told them, pick up your own mat. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, with that command came the strength to obey. It was a choice, right? He was given the necessary strength in his arms and legs to resume to a normal lifestyle. Right? You see, when the Lord heals our disease of sin and removes the devastating effects. He gives us the strength to carry the normal loads of everyday life. So if you go back, when I say the biggest lie that we are disabled, we are, in a way, because it's not in our own strength. It's in the Lord's strength. Right? And then that other lie is we can do it by ourselves. No, we can't. We need God. We need Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't relieve us of all our workloads and our responsibilities. He doesn't take away all the burdens and problems, right? And the trials of daily life. And I know this because I've been in a paralysis place for a while. I, I let my situations, I let the, the world, the, the things of the world, all my situations, all the craziest things that happened in my life put me in a place where I was paralyzed. You see, I'll whine and I'll scream and I'll kick and, and I'll be like, well, I'm, I'm the victim. And that puts me in a place of paralysis. Right? Oh, pity poor me, this happened to me and I'm just going to lay on my mat and I'm going to stay there and I'm going to cry on my mat. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want that. And when I realized when God picked me up, Jesus picked me up and said, son, let's go. He said, hold out your right hand. I will pick you up from the muck and the mire and we will go together. And so essentially he's saying, pick up your mat. Come with me, pick up your mat. Do you want to get well? What you guys didn't know is that intimidator kept me on the mat for a long time. Stepping out in the authority of who God called me to be. God called me to be here in this place at this time, who I am today. Right? And stepping out in all of those things that God's called. And I still know there's still more things he's calling us into, myself into. We have no clue. But it's exciting. It's exciting. You know, how many of us have a hard time getting up off the mat? I just had this analogy of getting knocked down, right? I'm a fighter, so, uh, you know, there, that's also called the mat, right? You get knocked down, you lay on the mat, and you get, a, you get a certain count, and you're done. Right? You see, how many of us have a hard time where we haven't fully taken advantage of the Lord, the strength of the Lord that He provides that he provides, you know, maybe remaining partially crippled by a victim mentality <laughs> or by memories of the past. I know I've done that. I've let my past memories hold me back, hold me in a place where I'm stuck. 
right? Or even maybe your past lifestyle, right? If God set you free, he is, we are free indeed, right? And we forget that. There is freedom, right? And we forget that. Maybe for some of us, we get up from the mat, but we don't want to shoulder the responsibilities of what God is calling us into. And so we were like, well, the mat's actually a little bit more comfortable. Maybe I'll stay here. <laughs> okay? Because following Jesus means we pick up our cross and we die daily. And sometimes that's hard to do. So the mat. Well, I'd rather be disabled than enabled. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Right? And some Christians, some of us, Maybe even feel the Lord is obligated to provide for their every desire, <laughs> whether they're willing to be obedient to him or not. That's an important thing to understand, right? Remember, it was sin. Actually, sin held them into place. It was something, wherever it came from, whether it was generational or whatever it was, it was there, right? But you hear, here we learn that the Lord asked us to get off our mats of disability. Amen? The Lord asks us to get off our mats of those disability. What is disabling us from our calling, our purpose, and his plan? Right? And there are, there's so many things. Fears. Fear of failure. Failure is a big one. <laughs> Competition, comparison. All of these things hold us on a mat. Right? Maybe we're just so in love with the world and all it has to offer, we just prefer to stay there. God says, come out of the world. Step out of the world. Step out of the darkness and into the light. But some of us see the light and then somehow I, I, I see a shift. Somehow the world becomes more alluring again. And I'll use alluring for a, word, a reason. It's like catching fish. Dave, you know if there's a good lure, it'll draw the fish there. Right? And, and, and the lure becomes a place again where we get put on the map. Right? Right? And to take up the duties and obligations of a lifestyle, move forward in Christian life. We need to get past that. We need to step into and through into the Christian life, right? Get up and walk. Get up and walk. Who wouldn't want to walk? It's supposed to be natural. It's supposed to be natural. Some of us walk with a limp or whatever, but we're still walking. It's natural. Jesus here in this piece is possibly saying, you think you know the main problem in your life, but you don't. Here's the truth over these lies. We're not disabled. We are enabled only through Jesus. Amen. That was what I was able to share with my brother. You are not disabled. You are enabled and only through Jesus. Don't let the enemy put you on a mat. You say, I am enabled and I will get off the mat. Right? When we, if we obey in this manner, he will give us the strength. He will give us the strength. So let's not expect God to do for us what he gives us the strength to do for ourselves, right? So what I mean by that, so let's not expect God to do for us what he gives us strength for, to do for ourselves. We can do it for ourselves. We don't need Jesus. I'm gonna tell you, church, sometimes we get put on the mat on purpose. I, I hate to tell you that. We get put on the mat on purpose so that we have to look up. We try to do things in our own strength. We need Jesus to do that, to carry us through and over and above all of these things. See, Jesus tells us to get up and walk. And that's a choice. And that choice we have to make and walk in it. First he says to him, do you want to get well? Well, who does not want to get well? And he says, get up and walk. Right? Second part here. <clears throat> yeah, so if you want to change the slide there. 
So there's help in the hopeless. You can't really see that, but it's okay. There's help in the hopeless. You see, often we look at a false hope. A false hope. Hope in the wrong things, right? So what's the significance of the mat? Right? It's the perceptions or response to our situations or our disposition. Right? The man was holding on to his mat. My precious. My precious. He was his possession, a treasured possession. Oh, I love you, my Matty. Ooh, I love you. You see, he slept on it. He rested on it. And he watched the world pass by on it. He certainly did, couldn't face the day without it. Church, do we do that? Do we do that? I might have missed my calling. Maybe I should have been an actor. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but you see, the mat is our paralysis identity. It's our home. It's our calling in life. It's our significance. It's our disposition. It's our hope in ourselves. And we go back and lie on the mat because remember why we had the mat in the first place, you know. We roll it up, and then we go back and lie down in the wounds of the past. The disappointments and all the hurts. And I know I've done this in my life. Right? It's like, oh, another one, I'll just go lay on my mat and get, sit in my disposition. What would Jesus have you and I pick up today? What would Jesus... Have you and I pick up today that we are holding so tightly as our only hope? Help me, Obi Wan. You're my only hope, <laughs> right? <laughs> that just came out, but honestly, maybe it's money, maybe it's health, maybe it's relationships, right? Maybe addictions, some of the behaviors that you have the habits we have, maybe even some of our hobbies that distract us. We put a hope in a hobby in what we're doing. See, Jesus tells a man to pick up his mat because he doesn't need it anymore. He doesn't need it anymore. Right? Because he says to the man, after he said, pick up your mat, you are enabled. You are enabled. Pick up your mat. You are enabled. You are not disabled. You are enabled. And so then the second part of this, so here's hope in the hopeless. So pool, there's a second place that he's putting his hope into is the pool. You see the pool? A Bethesda, which means in Aramaic, it means the house of mercy. It means the house of mercy it was a place where a spring-fed pool where a number of people of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralytic, right? People would wait expectantly as the pool because they believed an angel would come down the pool and stir up the water. It would only happen once a day. And the first one in the pool would be healed. And so there's a scramble. Again, I'll go back to the... The Chosen. The Chosen does a really good <laughs> depiction of this, right? He gets run over, he gets trampled, and, and he's, remember, he's paralyzed, right? So whoever stepped in the waters first was made well of whatever disease they had, right? The pool is the hope that we believe in, right? Every day I come here and the water is stirred. Right? The superstition and the belief of that time. Right? And, and it's in that superstition <laughs> is that other things can save me other than Jesus. Right? 
What hope do we put in things other than Jesus? I mean, church, really, think about it. This man is desperate. That's 38 years in lame in the same state. He's desperate. That's a long time. In desperation, he's willing to try anything. He's desperate. I think often we get that way too. We get desperate and we try the wrong things. We go from a place of despair and we get into things that even bring us into a worse place right, that we put our hope in, right, see, so far the pool was not working out well for him, it wasn't, I don't know how long he was actually at the pool, it just says that, it, that he suffered with this for 38 years, if you're sitting there at the pool for 38 years trying to get in, don't you think you'd be discouraged every day, don't you think you'd try to find something different, just stay in the pool, man, It's going to stir up. Just a thought. (laughs) Right? But I guess the the superstition is you have to go to the pool at a certain time of day for it to be stirred. Right? He never did actually make it down to the pool. Did he? He never did make it down to the pool. And if we're not careful, our mats and position at the pool can become our hope rather than our hope being Christ himself. Right? But with God's grace and mercy, it reigns over the judgment of his sin. Right? And he pours out his grace on withered, dry bones. <laughs> right? So we'll go to the next slide. Because he tells him to What? Rise, pick up your mat, and go home. In both of these places. But he says this. Now, here's the excuses we have, you guys. Here's our excuses. I have no one to get me in the pool. Right? Everyone else gets ahead of me. Everyone else gets ahead of me. We, we know this. If you go shopping, there's a long line, right? Oh, I, I'm here forever. Everybody else gets ahead of me. I don't know how that works. Or you're standing in line and you know, oh, we'll open till five over here. I've been standing for 20 minutes. And then line five and four or five other people jump into the line, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, everyone else gets ahead of me. I have no one to get me into the pool. Right? Are you feeling paralyzed by life today? Are you feeling feeling paralyzed by life today? Maybe blind or lame or physically, maybe mentally, emotionally. We're coming out of a season where it's just an emotional, we come out of an emotional wreck from COVID. What about spiritually? What about spiritually? You're feeling spiritually paralyzed? making excuses for not moving forward. God is calling us forward. (laughs) It's interesting, the man never did get to the pool. Jesus just showed up, singled him up, out, and made him whole. See, he was was overlooked. And I love Jesus' heart (laughs) because he loves the underdog. He loves the over, the ones that are overlooked. He does, that's his heart. So he sees this lame man who's overlooked. He can't get to the pool. And he says, you, sir, do you want to get well today? Somebody recognized him for who he is. He said, guys, get up. Take your mat. You are not disabled. You are enabled. Right? You see, maybe we do. Maybe we feel like we've been lying in the pool for years, waiting for help, waiting for help, making excuses for not moving forward. Maybe God's tugging at your heart and saying, hey, come to me. Come to me. But we make every excuse. Oh, I can't. I I don't want to have this relationship with you, Jesus, because, you know, I like this stuff over here. Maybe I like this over here. Or this, I might have to give up something over here. Right? Making excuses for not moving forward. 
You see, he asks this man, he says, do you want to get well? It's a little different than the first one that was lowered down into the roof. You see, he had no excuses. Everybody was carrying him there. Right? Everybody carried him to there, and then they lowered him down. He had no choice. He was kind of stuck. But his friends brought him into that place. And he says, first off, your sins are forgiven. Now pick up your mat and walk. Right? He says, rise, pick up your mat and walk. He picked up his mat and he walked. He picked up his mat and he walked. This command to rise is significant. Jesus sees forgiveness of sins as a form of rising from the dead. You understand that? When he says rise, it's more than just a command to rise. It means you're coming out of death. You're coming out of this place, this, this place of desperation, despair. It's death. He calls him out of this place. The man is buried in his hopelessness as year after year of disappointments. There's year after year of disappointment. He'd been heaped on him. That would feel like death. Spiritually, that would feel like death. I hear God himself says, rise, rise. And in the healing at the home where the man who is lowered in roof, Jesus specifically tells him to go home. See, this other one at the pool, he didn't say go home. We're not sure because we figure he's probably homeless just, just from basing, right? But we can assume that I'm sure that paralytic had family. He was going to go see his family, right? So he probably went home. So this formerly known paralyzed man is to rise and go home, right? You see the command rise? is a command from heaven. It's a command from heaven. This man was made whole. Do you want to hit my thing there? This man was made whole and was strengthened. And guess what? He was able to pick up his mat and walk. Not on his own strength at all. Right? And the purpose for this was probably for him to re-engage into life, into a new life. Right? And the purpose for carrying the mat and not leaving it there was the sign of healing. Remember the lady in the well when Jesus says, go and just leave, right? So he says that your sins are forgiven and she left her water jug, which was her identity. She left it there. You see, he tells him to take up his mat. That's his identity. That's his place that he is <laughs> as the sign of healing as a sign of healing. And he tells him to go home. And home, in Greek, is oikos, and it can refer to family. Go home, back to your family. Right? Jesus restores him back to his family. Now he's able to return home. Go home to your new life. Go home to your new life. Jesus' freedom from that which paralyzed him. Don't let the mat hold you back. Don't let the mat hold you back. You know, I, I hear that a lot with... Uh, we're, we're doing some stuff right now with some of the clients from Real City, and, and I hear that a lot. For these, all these people are disabled. They're not disabled. They're enabled in a different way. And man, it's so cool to just see that. When you see who they are, right? It's like, it is it's so empowering and it's so cool to just see who they, who they can be, right? We see Jesus' freedom from that which paralyzed them. And Jesus wants to do the same today. Jesus wants to do the same today. I tell you... I know, I know personally in my personal walk, there's days where I just feel like I'm in the mud. I'm in quicksand. I'm in a place where I'm trying to get out myself. And actually, the, the, thing, the trick about quicksand, the more you thrash around, the, the faster you sink. If you're just still, you actually become buoyant and you come back up. 
but it takes time to do that and to be still. But the panic and the flight reaction kicks in and we start drowning. Right? And that's the thing. I mean, just trying to help ourselves more and more and more. Right? Jesus wants to do the same today to us. Right? The, mass, the mat was a sign of his paralysis. You see, it's possible that Jesus wanted him to take up his mat as a memory of what was, what was so he'll continue to live with gratitude and mercy in his heart. <laughs> Just like a memory foam mattress. <laughs> right? <laughs> Because he calls it a mattress, too, or a mat. But think about it, a memory foam mattress, right? It knows your body. Pick up your mat, right? And our goal should be to trust him with all that we trust in most. We have to allow him to carry our burden, strengthen our walk, and brighten our future. I know when I've done this and and I've stepped off my mat and just like, you know what? That's in the past. It's gone. Man, there's new. There's new. There's new steps in my feet. When we talk about the the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, that's what that is. That means stepping in that place of peace that the gospel has done, that Jesus has done for us. And we can move and we can walk in those places that we never thought we could trod. Right? That's the, that's the truth over the lie that we are disabled. You understand that? That's why it tells us to put a piece of armor on so we can step forward into those places that God is calling us to do in peace, not all of the fighting that goes on in our mind to keep us stuck. Right? <laughs> you see, Jesus is there. He helps you. And the best way they can do is that we trust him more. We trust him more, right? To restore us. And to restore means that God makes restitution for what's been taken. (laughs) Right? And that means that it's complete to make safe. It means it's complete to make safe. And we can receive that healing today. Right? It only takes one word from Jesus to make us completely whole. Rise. 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 You see what's interesting? The Hebrew word for restitution is the same root word of shalom. Shalom means peace. Shalom means peace, which means that God makes us whole. He strengthens us. He restores our peace. Listen for his command. Listen for his command. To take our dry, disabled, dry bones, bring them back to life. To stand, picking up our mats to our feet, and then they become the army that we are called to be. This was written before our prophetic yesterday. Just as Ezekiel cried out to the dry bones, get up, rise. To believe the promises and speak of the promises of God. It's time, church, to open our mouths. It's time for us to open our mouths, speaking life into every situation, right? Because that, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we can speak that forth. We speak life into us. Right? The power of God is released when we release the power of God. Amen? And we can't do that on our own. We need Jesus to do that. That's why he says, rise, take up your bats. I will help you. Church, time to rise. Take up your mat and walk because we are called to do something farther and bigger and deeper than we can imagine. Each one of you has... Each one of you has a purpose, and God has a plan. And I know you guys are going through purpose-driven life, and that's what you're going through. Is like when we step into that place, man, God's already making your path. And when you step in that place, there is power. There is a position that you have. There is a place 
You want to switch the next one? Right? There's a place where we can go. I want to tell you guys, how many of you guys had a rough life? Come on. How many of you guys had things that happened to you that it, it, ridiculous? Yeah. Why? Because there was a calling on your life? There was a calling on your life and the enemy wanted to take you out. Right? And some of that too comes from our own stupidity. Don't get me wrong. Right? Our own sin can put us in these places. But I want to tell you, I know in my life the enemy tried to take me out when I was little because there was a plan and a purpose for his desire for me. And so the devil put me on a mat. Put me on a mat. And I had no clue who I was. And when God showed me who I was, when he saved me, when he, when he grabbed me off the mat and said, rise, come with me, and pulled me out of this place. Right? And there was a wrestle after that time, back and forth. I want to go back on my mat. I maybe go back here, or the devil. I listened to the enemy too much. And he put me on the mat. And he put me in this place of disposition. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of that enemy lying to us. I'm tired of the enemy trying to keep us down, stepping on us while we're laying on the mat. Right? Jesus comes along and tells us, get off the mat. Stop listening to that guy. Stop listening to the pool. Stop trying to get there yourself. Follow me. I can do it. Rise. Rise, which means die to yourself. Stop doing it yourself. Pick up your mat and walk. Church, I don't want to walk. I want to run. I want to run into the things that God has called me to do. I feel that there is a place for running. <laughs> that there is a place that there's, there's, there's strongholds that have been breaking down in this church. There's strongholds that have been breaking over these people for a long time. And they're coming down. And God, God is calling us forward in this time to move forward with momentum what he's calling us to do. So as we go, think about what is your mat. Think about what is a mat. What is holding you back? Because God wants you to run. Because you are not disabled. You are enabled. Amen? Amen. All right. Walk with Jesus. Amen? Walk with Jesus. You weren't meant to walk the walk alone. You were meant to walk with Jesus. That's why it's called a relationship. And he takes us home. Amen.